Hi everyone, good morning and welcome to Solar Media's Energy Storage Digital Series. My name is Lucy and I'll be your host for today's session. I'm the producer for the Energy Storage Wider Series, which we have running in Europe, the US and soon to be running in Latin America. I'd just like to say a huge thank you to our founding sponsor, Clean Horizon Consulting, and also to our series sponsors, EDF and NEC. Aside from our wider energy storage portfolio, you may know us better as the publishers of PV Tech, Energy Storage News, Current News, and also Solar Power Portal. If you'd like to see our full portfolio, subscribe for free to our publications and also register for our other free digital summits, which we have running across the summer months, please visit www.solarmedia.co.uk. So before we get going today with our first panel discussion, predicting the tech of the future, I'd like to share a few housekeeping notes with you all so that you can familiarize yourself with the platform. Um, first of all, if you have any questions for the panelists in today's session, please submit them in the questions tab, which you can see on your right. So put them in the questions tab and not the chat tab so that the moderator is able to answer them. Um, we also have a poll running this morning. So the poll for this morning is, what do you think will be the most prominent tech of the future in three to five years time? Um, so please get involved with that if you are interested. Um, I would also like to draw your attention to our special training session, which is run by Clean Horizon. This will be running on Wednesday, the 13th of May from 1 p.m. till 4 p.m. BST. Um, so that's 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. British summertime on Wednesday. This training session will look at the main European regulations for storage and is essential for anyone trying to tap into the European markets. Um, so also another piece of um, news, don't forget to log on to our Meet Me zone. This is a dedicated networking zone, which you can use to organize meetings with other participants, meet new partners, new suppliers, and just do new business. Um, finally, all the content across the week will be will be recorded and available to access after the sessions are over. So now I'd like to move on to the main part of today's session and welcome our speakers to the stage. First of all, we have Corentin Bachet, Head of Market Analysis at Clean Horizon, who will be your moderator for the session. Welcome, Corentin. Thanks, Lucy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So I work for Clean Horizon. We're a consulting company dedicated to energy storage, and I'll be I'll be moderating this session. Uh, thanks, uh, Solar Media, for partnering us. We're partnering with us for this event. Uh, we really look forward to it, uh, providing uh, both uh, the training that you mentioned, uh, plus content, and uh, helping you through this. Um, I have the privilege this morning to to start this conference with a uh, with a couple of of great panelists uh, who will introduce themselves as, as I welcome them them uh, on stage. So I'll start with, with Jim Stover, who's a uh, who's working for a Vanadium Flow company. Uh, he's based in the U.S. Uh, right now. So thanks for for joining early in the morning. Uh, welcome, Jim. If you can uh, join the stage and uh, briefly introduce yourself. Okay, great. Here you are. Hi, Hi Jim. Uh, thanks. Uh, glad to be on the panel. I appreciate the uh, invitation. Look forward to it. Uh, I'll give you a 30 second background on myself. I've been in renewable energy and distributed energy for the past uh, 20 years or so um, with uh, a number of different startups uh, handling multiple technologies from wind to solar to inverters. And uh, I'm now uh, the chief marketing officer and, and handle. Uh, commercial operations for VRB Energy, which, as you said, is a vanadium redox flow battery company. Uh, I've been with the company a little over three years now, and uh, we have a number of uh, projects installed uh, in, in China and under development in China and the U.S. and the rest of the world, uh, and look forward to uh, participating uh, on the panel today, talking about uh, batteries. Uh, and the future uh, future of storage. Th thanks, Jim. Uh, so then I welcome uh, Dr. Billy Wu, who's uh, who actually uh, lectured me uh, five years ago at Imperial College. So uh, uh, good to see you uh, 
today. Uh, if you can join the stage and briefly introduce yourself and what you do at Imperial, uh, that'd be great. Great. And thank you very much for the uh, invite. Um, as uh, Quarantine mentioned, uh, I'm Billy Wu. I'm a senior lecturer at Imperial College London, where I lead a research group called the Electrochemical Science and Engineering Group. We work at the interface between fundamental science and engineering application of devices such as batteries, fuel cells, and supercapacitors, which includes uh, cross-cutting activities such as developing new materials, but also on the engineering side of thermal management systems, battery management systems, and understanding lifetime. Great, thanks Billy. And uh, our last uh, speaker today is Matt Allen. He's the CEO of Pevot Power, a uh, UK company. I'll let him uh, introduce himself and his company. Great, thank you very much and uh, great to be here. So quick introduction. Um, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Pivot Power. Um, we have a very clear purpose and mission to accelerate the overall transition to a clean electric future. Um, we're focused as a developer, owner and operator um, of large scale battery storage connected to the transmission system. Um, in addition, we're also looking to take the spare capacity and run that into the local markets um, to really accelerate the transition uh, to a clean electric future from a transport standpoint. So we're looking at this from two um, different angles, um, but very much not from, you know, we're technology agnostic, I guess I would say. Um, so great to be a part of this panel and uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. So while preparing for this panel, we've, we've found a, a number of topics to address and uh, uh, actually uh, probably the, 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 the most burning one uh, for everyone is probably the closest to the one relating to the future tech, the future technology for uh, stationary storage. And we actually have uh, one technology manufacturer on this panel. That's, that's Jim. And uh, I'll all ask you this question, but Jim, maybe you can start uh, uh, answering this question. Uh, what uh, does your um, so wh why do you think I guess you you're you're manufacturing vanadium and we're all looking for what's going to be, be behind lithium lithium ion which is today uh, probably represents more than 98 percent of the market share for stationary storage uh, installed globally but the question is what will be next uh, and you I, I believe uh, uh, your company has an edge in flow batteries please um, Tell us a bit on the advantages, maybe the costs. Uh, why do you think it could be the next one uh, after lithium? Sure. Uh, glad to talk about that. Uh, as you said, lithium dominates uh, the market right now with a number of different chemistries. Um, some are more suited to uh, electric vehicles and, and portable technologies. Some are being uh, optimized for longer duration, higher cycle lives on the grid. Uh, the technology has been around for 30 plus years and of course we all we're all probably carrying two or three lithium-ion batteries in our cell phones and laptops and, and portable devices so there's been a tremendous amount of uh, benefit of uh, scale up for lithium-ion uh, in consumer electronics and, and portable devices over the years so uh, the amount of uh, gigawatt hours essentially that's already been manufactured has allowed lithium ion to come down the, uh, the learning curve. Um, and uh, similar to, to solar, a learning rate of maybe 15% for, for lithium ion batteries, solar certainly over 20% learning rate, uh, they've been able to come down as manufacturing's increase. And we're at the beginning, uh, still early on in that um, learning rate and, and cost reduction and, and performance improvement process for vanadium flow batteries. And there will be other battery technologies as well. I think the key thing there is as we scale up, we have a tremendous ability to continue to reduce costs and increase performance. So there's a lot of good things to come uh, with uh, vanadium flow batteries. Um, a little bit about the difference in battery types, uh, as, as I believe most people understand, uh, in a vanadium flow battery, the liquid electrolyte is separate from uh, the cell stacks where uh, the, the power rating uh, is uh, assessed or power is generated. And the benefit of storing the energy in the electrolyte uh, is that, uh, and, and with vanadium in particular, which is the same electrolyte on both sides of the battery, 
uh, is that the electrolyte doesn't wear out uh, and the cycles can be repeated uh, essentially in, indefinitely. So the problem, the two major problems that the industry is seeing with uh, lithium ion batteries right now as they're being used in these larger and larger projects are that the, the batteries degrade over time with heavy use. Uh, and heavy use can be multiple cycles uh, per, per day uh, or in using the full depth of discharge of the battery. Uh, and, and so the industry is looking for a better alternative. So larger format uh, electrolyte separate from the cell stacks and the power of vanadium flow batteries are, are more, uh, are more uh, beneficial to larger grid scale projects and I think we'll we'll see that adoption coming. The second thing with lithium ion batteries is safety and I think you the panel will talk about that a little bit more. There have been a number of fires uh, approaching 30 fires in uh, in Korea, uh, also significant incidents in the US in, in Arizona uh, where first responders have been injured responding to, to lithium ion battery uh, fires and explosions. And so safety is definitely going to be something the industry wants to uh, to improve upon. And uh, the medium flow batteries are, are non-combustible, so uh, they offer an advantage from a, a safety and uh, long-term operation perspective. I'll stop there, we'll get into yeah. much more later. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about safety a bit later. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, so, but Billy, uh, you, you work uh, at Imperial on future technology, and especially, uh, uh, I, if I remember correctly, our preparation on aeronautics. And what do you see uh, coming? Because today, Jim's mentioned that what brought lithium in is the price uh, reduction. So that's one. Uh, where can that go, uh, you think? And the second is uh, where, uh, what's next? What's coming and that might come from? So we saw that lithium come, comes from EVs. Uh, what might be next and where should it come from? Yeah, it's a good question. So if you look at the lithium ion battery field, the, the year on year cost reductions are somewhere in the region of 16%. Bloomberg New Energy Finance has a very good and comprehensive tracker of that. But to look forward a little bit, I think um, in a, around the world, we're seeing a lot of uh, major announcements. So in the UK, we've announced that we want to be net zero emission by 2050. And when you have a total system look at decarbonization, there's certain um, things like decarbonization of heat, which is very difficult, which is why a lot of people now are looking at beyond lithium, uh, technologies such as hydrogen, uh, where uh, the idea is that uh, you take hydrogen, which you can generate either through uh, electrolysis of water or steam reforming of methane. You can uh, then put that onto the natural uh, gas uh, network if you've got some. Uh, and or you can use it directly in a fuel cell uh, to generate electricity. And if you look internationally, I think there's some very interesting moves in China, where in the pr uh, previously a lot of their fundamental R&D was focused on lithium ion batteries. And that's quite interesting because a lot of their major automotive uh, OEMs, they previously couldn't um, sell their vehicles in North America and Europe. And they saw electric vehicles and batteries as a way to leapfrog that. Arguably now with companies like CATL, who are very prominent in the area, uh, the industry is much stronger and can sustain it. So a lot of that fundamental research funding is shifted towards hydrogen, where there isn't an incumbent LG Chem or Samsung to dominate the field. So I think in the next few years, we're going to see a lot of based technologies, which could have kind of beneficial uh, impacts on uh, flow batteries because they share a lot of components, such as the membranes, and so on, because as we'll mention later on with cost, a lot of it is related to scale and the, the amount of deployment that you have. And uh, essentially, if you can deploy hydrogen at scale and reduce the cost of those components, flow batteries inevitably benefit from that. And um, so I'll probably um, stop there and uh, pass over to Matt for his comments on uh, maybe a bit more on the lithium ion battery side. Yes, so Matt, indeed, if, since you, you purchase, so you, as a developer, you, you purchase solutions. So what's your point of view on this? Uh, so your, your projects currently have a, a lithium and a flow battery uh, uh, part. So how does these two parts work together? And uh, how do you see that moving in the future? And what's the key, most importantly, maybe for our audience, what are you looking for uh, as an investor in the technology? Sure. Um, I mean, I think what you know we look for, and from an investor's standpoint, um, it is around 
you know, reliability uh, cost curves coming down are obviously hugely important to make sure that we see mass scale adoption, but um, price is obviously one parameter within this, you know, this comes down to warranty packages, uh, it comes down to the kind of financial solvency um, of, you know, the technology provider that we're working with as well. Um, so a number of, of things that, uh, that, that we're looking at um, when making key procurement decisions. Um, in terms of the first two projects, yes, we have uh, both are 50 megawatt of lithium ion. Um, one of our projects um, we do have as a flow um, component that we're bolting on to the lithium. And one of the biggest benefits is it improves the degradation um, kind of life cycle uh, that when we're going to be topping up because we want to run these batteries very hard. Um, but that flow component um, going into this, you know, looks like it should uh, should help uh, that degradation profile. Um, there's always, you know, a lot of views, and this is across all, you know, technologies, the energy sector, and even outside. But what are those kind of black swan technologies that are going to come out of, you know, potentially out of left field um, that will be a real game changer, um, in both from a cost standpoint, but also reliability. Um, so that's something that you know we are and we'll continue to look at very closely. But one of the biggest things I think we'll touch on kind of the bankability point um, is what is investable now? Um, what are investors comfortable with, um, you know, putting their capital behind um, and being able to have that, you know, stack up and meet the return expectations uh, that are required? But what are also the kind of future requirements of the overall energy system? Is it more of a longer duration um, type uh, application, um, kind of the power versus energy uh, battery uh, that we talk about a lot in the industry. So those are the okay. few starting points. Okay, so you you mentioned costs, and I think uh, that's uh, that's uh, the cost, and and BD and Jim also also tackled it. So the cost of uh, of lithium is the reason the, the decreasing cost is the reason why it's been adopted so massively uh, at the start on the stationary storage side. And uh, why, um, so you, you assess, uh, what we prepared, I understand, uh, Matt, that you said um, the key question, the key metric you were looking at is, is the levelized cost of storage. So there are a lot of, uh, of discussions around this, uh, this metric because it has some bias. There's a lot of ways of, of uh, computing it. So there's a lot of methods. Uh, there are always some tricks. So what's your uh, opinion of the LCOS metric today? Uh, as an investor, how do you see it? And uh, uh, is that really the key point, the key first uh, metric after reliability uh, that you mentioned? Um, it is. I mean, I think one of the, I'm sure Jim could attest to this in any technology uh, solution provider, but you know, there are a lot of developers in the market, not just in the UK, but further afield. Uh, there are a lot of large pipelines. Uh, there's, you know, forecasts currently in the system at different stages of development, you know, gigawatts and gigawatts just here in the UK. Um, I think it comes down to developers that can deliver, um, that have a very robust plan, uh, that have an investor base that sits behind them, um, that is committed you know, to the sector. Um, so I think we will continue to keep a close eye on cost. I think that, you know, there are economies of scale and benefits of, um, you know, procurement at a many hundreds of megawatt you know, standpoint that developers will, purchasers will see. Um, but I think the cost curves that we saw three years ago when we were looking at more behind the meter type applications, um, those costs came down dramatically. Um, it was incredible. I mean, it was month by month. And you were just seeing these, these great cost curves come down. I think you're starting to see more of a traditional cost curve uh, profile that you've seen within solar PV at the module level, same thing with wind turbines, where we're kind of getting that inflection point where the adoption, a lot of this has been supported uh, at the electric vehicle level because uh, a lot of the production capacity is driven there. Um, and there have also been some issues around, you know, access because so much is being hoovered up, you know, at the at the vehicle level. Um, you know, what is available at the, store, uh, the stationary for stationary applications. It seems to be less of a constraint than it was um, previously, but um, you know, cost will continue to be a big component. But uh, my assumption is that we won't see as dramatic uh, cost reductions as we've seen in the past. 
Okay, so it's interesting. So I'm looking at the results of the poll right now. We we went on. If you haven't uh, um, participated, uh, please feel free on the on the poll tab to to select the question that we we asked to the audience is, uh, what do you think will be the most prominent tech of the future in three to five years? And I think Matt, that's where oh, I mean, there's a consensus today that uh, in the three to five years, uh, hydro uh, lithium ion, sorry, is going to be a uh, to be prominent and it will be the the leading technology. There's no reason why, I mean, it's difficult for me as well to see any other technology coming in, uh, reducing the cost uh, fast enough to, to catch up with lithium ion. But I guess um, that's, uh, there's, we all agree that there's a, a point where uh, the there's a question of material within uh, lithium ion and the cost of a battery will never go uh, below the cost of the materials that are uh, within it. And we mentioned about the, uh, during the preparation, we, we discussed the, these materials. There's of course uh, cobalt, there's lithium, there's uh, manganese in the NMC technology. Maybe Billy, you could, um, you could um, provide us a bit of details. You mentioned the choice of Chinese in the beginning for, for lithium and the incentives. Uh, what about LFP? Uh, versus NMC, so the the Chinese technology. How is that changing? Uh, is there a change from uh, NMC uh, from LFP to NMC, or is there a safety advantage of LFP? What are what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a it's a good question there. So if we look back at the history of lithium ion batteries, there's actually lots of different flavors. Lithium cobalt oxide, which was the first commercialized lithium ion battery chemistry, um, by John Goodenough, the Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. Uh, last year. Um, that was reasonably good in terms of energy density, but it had poor cost and poor safety implications. And we gradually saw a shift towards uh, replacing cobalt, which is very costly and has ethical uh, considerations around its uh, sourcing, towards uh, manganese-based chemistries and also lithium iron phosphate, which you've just mentioned, which actually got quite a lot of use in consumer power tools, and also uh, things like electric buses because they had very good power capability. But fundamentally, their energy density, so the range of an electric vehicle, uh, wasn't particularly good, which is why we transitioned towards the uh, NMC chemistries, so combinations of nickel, manganese, and cobalt, where over the last few years, the focus has been moving from NMC 111, so one part nickel, to cobalt, uh, to manganese, towards 811, so eight parts nickel, to one parts cobalt, uh, and one part of manganese to reduce that. And I think um, that's for automotive where energy density is the important consideration for, for grid where lifetime is critical. So you might be looking at maybe 20 years worth of life uh, that you want. Lithium ion phosphate is actually seeing a resurgence both in automotive, so BYD are uh, providing uh, and showing some very good improvements in energy density. Uh, Tesla with their model three economy range um, they are going to be uh, releasing a lithium ion phosphate vehicle, but they still will maintain their nic uh, NMC chemistry, so nickel, cobalt, aluminium. So there's lots of different flavors, but I think for grid, uh, lithium ion phosphate has a lot of advantages because it shows much better uh, both lifetime and also safety implications, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later, but this can be quite critical and it has cost knock-ons later on in terms of the insurance um, of the energy storage asset. Great, thanks. Uh, maybe Jim, you can comment on this regarding uh, vanadium. What's the so we, we, Billy mentioned uh, the, the difference of, uh, of density between LFP and NMC, which has an advantage uh, regarding safety because uh, when we're storing energy, of course, there's a, a safety risk because it's energy, so it can be released in the, in the matter of fire. Uh, regarding uh, this, what's the footprint of a typical vanadium flow uh, battery in megawatt hours or megawatt, any figure you can provide? And then maybe actually we already had the, a question on the costs. Uh, it, can you uh, provide a target or uh, uh, something you currently have um, uh, at, uh, within your company in terms of uh, reference for these costs? Sure. Uh, okay. Glad to pick those topics up. Uh, on uh, the uh, performance side of things, uh, yes, the ability to uh, uh, as Matt says, work the batteries hard, uh, deep cycles, daily cycling, uh, that's something that, that vanadium flow batteries 
are are well suited to, um, and and that plays into having uh, levelized uh, cost of energy advantages or levelized cost of storage uh, advantages. So quick quick point uh, on that uh, from the cost perspective. Uh, we're not as cheap as uh, lithium-ion batteries are right now, but as I mentioned before, we're still much higher up on that uh, learning curve, uh, that cost reduction curve. So uh, for every doubling of manufacturing volume, we probably have somewhere between a 15 to 20 percent reduction in, in cost. And that's simply because we're, we're playing catch up with uh, the lithium-ion that's, that's already out there. So that's a, a good good thing for for us. Um, I won't talk about it right now. Perhaps we'll park it for later. But sourcing vanadium and sourcing some of these other raw materials, obviously, there's inherent uh, minimum costs uh, associated with that, um, and uh, we have a a good forward-looking profile for sourcing vanadium. So, from a future cost perspective, we we don't see uh, there's a limit um, to us catching up and, and even surpassing lithium ion from an upfront cost perspective. Um, from a, a footprint perspective uh, on lithium iron phosphate, for example, uh, they're about um, uh, two megawatt hours in a 40 foot shipping container uh, to, to frame things for you uh, for projects that are getting installed in, in China right now. Um, we do. Uh, we have a subsidiary in China where we do uh, some of our vanadium sourcing and our manufacturing, uh, and we know that market well. And so we're in China. We're competing head to head with uh, lithium iron phosphate at about two megawatt hours per container. Uh, of course, you can be more dense with other batteries, uh, other chemistries. But as as Billy said, uh, that can lead you to uh, safety concerns or safety safety issues. Um, so we're, we're probably uh, about uh, twice the size of, of that from a density perspective right now. And we're continuously working on improving uh, the density of our electrolyte. So getting more uh, energy out of a, a lower volume of electrolyte. And, and that's quite promising too, uh, as well as uh, we're, we're looking out three to five years, the, the ability to uh, deliver electrolyte in, in what we might call a paste uh, format and reconstituting the electrolyte on site. So helping reduce uh, logistics cost as well, which matters to uh, developers and installers like, like Matt. So there, there, there are multiple elements uh, of, of cost and safety. They're all, they're all connected and, and we're working on all of them at, at the same time, really. Okay, so today you can fit, uh, if I if I cut it correctly, uh, one megawatt hour, you can fit one megawatt hour of electrolyte within a, one container, and that's uh, with the stack as well, or does it need to be a part? Uh, that, would, that would be total with uh, the stack okay. and, and the electrolyte. Right. Okay, great, yes, so um, maybe uh, twice the footprint of, of LFP today, but uh, it's possible to have it modular and, uh, and change in the future. Uh, something more standard. Um, we've discussed, actually you mentioned about re recyclability and, uh, and uh, ethical considerations. Uh, maybe it would be good to have a, a Matt's pers perspective on this, because of course today uh, lithium-ion uh, has issues uh, regarding how you source materials, uh, even though Billy said we, we're reducing the share of cobalt uh, from a, a third to a one out of ten, so a tenth. Uh, but how how is this perceived from an investor point of view? How do you see? Uh, um, how can we convert? How can we make it better? Because we're all aware uh, there's no green energy, right? I don't really like green energy. Renewable works, uh, but green uh, any energy has a footprint. Uh, wind, solar has a. You you always need. It's all about transforming, and you always get a footprint. The question is, what is this footprint, and how can we mitigate it? And I think. Um, the question is, how can we improve this uh, as an industry? Uh, how we can, can we improve our footprint? So by recycling, by making sure we source material. Uh, what's, your, what's your perspective, Matt, on this? Uh, what are you looking for? Are you looking for a solution that is 100% recyclable? Uh, how do you value this? You mentioned ethics as well when we prepared. So what do you think? Yeah, it's... Um... Unfortunately, I'm going to, I guess, highlight more questions than provide any answers. And I wish that I could provide answers, but I think this is a bit of a call 
to action for the industry as a whole. Um, if we look at this from a kind of upstream perspective, um, you know, mining practices um, for cobalt particularly, but other uh, precious materials, um, you know, chi child labor practices that are taking place, um, the percentage uh, that is coming from the Congo and so on. I mean, this is this is a very, very serious topic, and it's something that we've spoken to uh, cell providers about in terms of what those practices look like. Um, there's been a lot of pressure, um, I think, externally, which is good, and that's absolutely needed to make sure that you know the production extraction uh, mining is is done right. Um, there are other factors that we're looking at in terms of you know the transportation of you know, large assets from one part of the world uh, to another. Um, so once they are containerized and, and kind of arriving to UK shores, um, and then once that asset is, you know, installed and operational, I have, there are a lot of different assumptions in terms of if we fast forward and we're running, you know, our assets very, very hard, year eight, year nine, what those components and what we'll be able to do uh, to repurpose them. Um, will that be able to extract and flow, you know, components of those back uh, into the market? Um, will there be the ability to use those second life systems uh, for alternative uh, use in other developing, uh, you know, countries as well? Um, so, you know, there is also the fire suppression systems. Um, those also fall into kind of the overall ethics and health and safety, um, you know, piece. And there's been a lot of focus there. Um, you know, the, this, what those suppression systems look like, um, you know, the configuration, the layout, and the kind of social distancing, if you will, of, um, you know, containers and how they're, you know, applied, um, you know, in large fields, wherever that may be. Um, so, again, I wish I could provide you, a, you know, a clear declaration in terms of what we're doing and what others in the market are doing, but at present, I see more big headline questions um, that absolutely need answers but we are very light on answers at present okay yeah and uh, of course uh today so most in, in europe there's a requirement for 50 percent of mass of the batteries to be to be recycled uh it's of when we mentioned that it's important to say that it's it's this percentage of mass is actually uh just a matter of uh it's being used again it's not necessarily being we're not extracting the materials from these batteries to make uh new batteries so it's just used again for roads for uh envelopes uh, etc so i think we indeed need to to move the industry forward uh, regarding this and it's you investors that are that uh by asking this question can, can push it forward Absolutely. um Maybe reg regarding safety, so you mentioned Arizona, uh, Jim, um, you also mentioned the, the fires in Korea. What, uh, so at Clean Horizon, we, we've taken a brief look at this and we, we've seen two, well, South Korea is a specific case because the market grew up 300% uh, uh, from 2018 to 2019 and the, the, the pace of adoption was, was crazy because of the high incentives for PV plus storage and wind plus storage. So uh, the report from the Korean, uh, uh, from the Korean government pretty much uh, showed that uh, this was due to um, to installations that were faulty most of the time, not due to battery types. Um, how about um, this? So this is being taken care of. The, the fires in Arizona, France has done a, a huge job in trying to uh, to understand the concern, the pressurized container, and how they can can work on this, uh, getting uh, getting better. Um, there's so we've mentioned uh, flow flow batteries and uh, vanadium. Uh, how much of the vanadium can you recycle, and can vanadium uh, catch fire, Jim? Right. Well, uh, just a couple more points on the uh, lithium-ion battery uh, fires and the explosion in in Arizona. Um, that that was installed by uh, Fluence or AES at the time, and and their essentially the, the, the global leader in installing energy storage. So um, it's when you have the, the global leader in storage 
uh, having issues, uh, major issues with a system that they've designed and installed after only a couple of years, uh, it's certainly uh, a, a severe warning to the industry to, um, to really get to root cause and to add safety measures. Um, it, it put four people, four first responders in the hospital with, with severe issues. And, and, and uh, so there, there's more work to be done on engineering systems safely. And then of course, uh, informing local responders what to do uh, when there is an issue. And you know, unfortunately there, there, there will probably continue to be issues. Um, the issues for vanadium flow uh, were a little bit different. Uh, the, uh, we, we don't have to worry about um, uh, temperature and voltage management in the same way. Uh, for larger scale systems, we could have large tanks of electrolyte versus essentially millions of cells, small cells of lithium ion batteries that um, have to be very carefully managed uh, with a, a BMS or battery management system. And that's another complex part of, of the, the lithium ion battery system that's uh, that developers are learning uh, more and more about that adds cost. For example, uh, several developers that we talked with have to uh, have uh, data warehousing of, of, of an intense amount of data to uh, make sure that they, they can prove to the OEMs uh, that they haven't violated warranty terms. So uh, the cost of maintaining that data is actually not insignificant. And it's, it's one more element uh, of the sort of hidden complexity of managing millions and millions of lithium ion battery cells in a large scale system. So uh, back to your, your, your question on safety and, and recyclability, uh, you know, we don't have the thermal runaway or uh, combustibility uh, issue that, that lithium ion would in terms of, uh, of that. Uh, from a recyclability and, uh, perspective on end of life, uh, our system is the electrolyte, uh, which is probably 50% or more of the system itself uh, in terms of cost and then uh, also in terms of volume uh, greater than that. And uh, that can be reused in another vanadium flow battery or it could be recycled out for the underlying vanadium metal content, which uh, is a commodity primarily used in, in steel manufacturing. Uh, and the rest of the system, the balance of the system is, is plastic piping and steel framing. So plastic and steel uh, certainly are, are more readily recycled and recovered than uh, other elements in, uh, in non-vanadium flow batteries. So we have a net positive end of life uh, value and a very green footprint. Uh, one more thing on the, on the green aspect of things, uh, the uh, vanadium itself, the metal, uh, that is suspended in the electrolyte can be sourced from waste materials such as uh, fly ash and spent petroleum catalysts. So, uh, and, and there, there's a tremendous amount of such waste residues available uh, uh, in the global economy. So uh, drawing on waste put into the batteries and then recyclability to have a net positive value at the end of life uh, is definitely another advantage for vanadium for batteries. That's very interesting. Uh... I'm aware of time and we need to go to uh, our next topic, which is, and, and you actually tackle a little bit, which, which is bankability and, um, and um, the, the, the business cases for storage, because we, we've tackled a bit the characteristics of the different technologies, but uh, there's one thing we haven't really uh, uh, discussed is, uh, okay, what's being bankable? What's a, what's a, what's a technology like maybe Billy, uh, oh, it seems we, we've lost Matt. Uh, he, We'll wait. We won't wait until he reconnects, but uh, hopefully he'll reconnect soon. Uh, Billy, what do you think is uh, the um, in terms of uh, bankability uh, is required from for you for a technology point of view for a technology to go live? Um, so I think over the last few years we've heard a lot about uh, breakthrough and paradigm shift technologies, and it's it's great to see so much innovation in the field. But I think very few of those technologies actually make it through to full commercialization. In the US, they have a joint uh, JCSIS, which is the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research. And they've defined something called the battery technology readiness levels, which articulates um, the stages a technology has to go through from fundamental discovery into commercialization. And for a lithium-ion battery technology, for instance, 
um, that can take upwards of 10 years to uh, go through those validation steps. And one of the, the main uh, uncertainties is lifetime. You might have developed a very promising material with good energy density uh, and good characteristics. But ultimately, as you synthesize that material from the gram scale to the ton scale, you're introducing additional uncertainty. As you scale up from the single cell to the pack uh, level and system level, where you might have thousands, if not uh, hundreds of thousands of cells connected together, there's a lot of uncertainty that uh, uh, comes into the system. So uh, I think it was mentioned before that safety uh, is a key consideration where ultimately someone's got to ensure the system if it does catch fire. And right now, there's so much uncertainty around, um, you know, whether something will spontaneously combust. Obviously, we have systems to suppress the fire, but that adds extra cost uh, to the system. So really, uh, in my mind, a bankable system has to be uh, safe, uh, which can come from the chemistry. So as Jim mentioned, vanadium is inherently safe, but there are still some uh, considerations to be made there. Lithium ion um, is becoming safer. Lithium ion phosphate is becoming safer. But we don't have good, very good models or very good understanding of when these spontaneous failure mechanisms happen. We have good models of degradation. Um, so that's a, a challenge uh, and also an opportunity in the future, which I think if we're trying to increase the bankability, understanding risk so that um, people who finance these projects can understand them better is something that hopefully we can provide moving forward. Mm, and you mentioned the degradation profile and actually that... That makes me think, Matt, uh, when you're purchasing a 50 megawatt storage system, uh, what you're doing at Pivot Power, what can we expect today as guarantees or what do you ask manufacturers as guarantees? How good are we in predicting how the batteries will degrade and uh, how, um, uh, how, do you, how do you approach this, this the guarantees aspect? Well, and that's, you know, there's obviously a huge role for you know, Billy and his colleagues to play in terms of kind of validating or pressure testing some of those assumptions that are being made by uh, manufacturers, um, which inherently are being done in, in controlled environments and so on. Um, I think, you know, performance, reliability, uptime, you know, if you will, track record um, overall, you know, in the market. I think also Bloomberg New Energy Finance on the bankability survey They've gone out to numerous um, you know, investors, and you know, really there were three of the major lithium ion companies um, out of, I think, kind of 30, 35 um, that have been invested in to date um, that are deemed 100% bankable. So the hopes and the expectations are that there'll be more companies that start getting to that level of investor confidence um, that allow them to deploy large amounts of capital into you know that specific technology um, but the warranty packages are hugely hugely important um, but you know a warranty needs to sit with a company that has you know a strong financial position that will be able to sit behind these um, kind of stating the obvious there um, so i think you know we're seeing more and more conclusive research that in controlled environments, but also in assets that are operational in the market, you know, that they are performing against expectation and standards, um, which is a good thing. And that only increases investor confidence. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there are some very good signs because you, you kind of do side with the investor view that before you, know, you invest, you want to have that confidence, um, you know, that assets are going to perform. So I think we're seeing all the right signs and you know i've been telling my wife for a long time now that this is the year for storage this is the year for storage it does absolutely feel that that time is now um, and so i think we're really going to see some serious acceleration great and uh, matt also we've discussed uh, we've discussed your company has env uh, env envisioned from the, the beginning the the compatibility of stationary storage with uh, with the electric vehicles and your um, you keep looking for ways of uh, building private wires of uh, uh, make uh, storage uh, enables uh, the deployment of uh, charging stations what's your um, uh, and then we'll let uh, billy comment on that but how how is uh, 
what do you think of this technology which we haven't mentioned yet which is vehicle to grid uh, really so the ability of uh, discharging a battery a vehicle's battery into the grid or the ability of just uh, uh, enabling a charging station to be connected to the grid because maybe the, the grid connection is not big enough so how how do you see this link between uh, vehicles and stationary storage today for uh, for pivot power yeah, I mean, to quickly comment, I mean, the biggest reason why we want to see that that private wire offtake component um, come into the revenue stack is that inherently, again, stating the obvious, is that the battery investment is a merchant you know, investment. Um, and having conversations with a lot of investors over the course of the last few years is that there there's you know, a feeling that government backed subsidies are the only thing that you can really invest in. Um, and, you know, not sounding too arrogant here, uh, that's not the case. You know, these are sound investments that in a system that is only going to have more intermittency, more renewables deployed, that creates an incredible opportunity for storage. Um, there will be um, advantages for the early, early adopters. So that offtake um, component is, is very important to create a more robust um, investment stack um, with some secured revenues. On the vehicle to grid, it is arguably, we talked about this last week, it has gotten a lot of uh, airtime and focus. Um, I would love to be proven wrong um, when it comes to this topic, but I find it very challenging to have thousands of vehicles throughout the country kind of all coming together and connecting um, to create volume of storage that we really need. I do see it hugely um, applicable um, for fleets, vans, buses, all coming to roost to sleep at 8 p.m. until 8 a.m. Um, that is a large single battery asset in a fixed location. It is very predictable in its demand and its usage, but for the individual household, um, for the financial benefits, um, which are pretty limited, while a, you know, a third party is playing with the most expensive part of your vehicle asset. Um, I, I just see a lot of challenges for yeah. the distributed vehicle to grid application, but that's a personal view. And again, I'd love to be proven wrong. Yes, yeah, so indeed there's two, um, are you, sorry, listen. Hi, sorry, Corentin, yeah. just, just to jump in. Um, just wanna, there's a couple of questions which have appeared in the questions yes. tab. So I just wanna make sure that they're answered. <laughs> Um, for the attendees. Yes, so the, the first one was on the LCOS for vanadium flow, and I think uh, uh, we've asked this to Jim, uh, who said he's just on, on the beginning of the learning curve. Uh, so I think we've already addressed this one. Um, okay. there's, there's one, yeah, maybe we can address it to, to Billy, which says, what's your opinion uh, on the most suitable technology for storage uh, regarding NMC? Should it be eight, uh, 811 or one? I think your explanation, maybe you can develop on why are we uh, essentially decreasing uh, the share of uh, cobalt, uh, of cobalt and manganese, and why are we increasing the share of nickel? Um, what's the best? I think we're going towards uh, 811, so it's, it should be the best, but please uh, explain us why and how. Yeah, so energy density is at the core of uh, why we're shifting towards nickel rich. Um, so as you put more nickel in, uh, your battery becomes more energy dense, but then the safety does take a hit in terms of um, the stability of the material. Uh, one challenge is also that as you increase the nickel, it becomes more sensitive to moisture. So a factory which is set up to manufacture 111, where we use dry room conditions, might not necessarily be appropriate for 811. And I think when we consider the uh, cost of uh, energy storage, we need to consider the whole uh, supply chain of where the material comes from, the processing uh, and um, the environmental impact that actually to manufacture lithium ion batteries, it consumes a large amount of electricity because as we mix the battery electrode slurries, we have to dry them and that energy can be quite substantial. So around the world, depending on how green the electricity is there, that will impact the sustainability or environmental footprint of those batteries. So I think in the Nordic countries, the North Pole, uh, they have very green electricity there. So they are building potentially the most sustainable and green uh, battery around. Great. Okay. So there's a, another question. Uh, I don't know who's the most 
Um, it's from Vinay. Beyond vanadium flow batteries, do you see more scope for iron flow or zinc bromide battery? Make, maybe, Jim, you can uh, you can tackle that as the manufacturer of flow battery on, on, on this panel. Sure. So those chemistries have been known for a while. Um, I, I think uh, to, to keep it short and simple for folks, uh, energy density of, of iron flow uh, is, is certainly something. And on the zinc batteries, whether it's zinc bromide, uh, or zinc air even. Uh, while zinc can be a low cost material, uh, essentially what you're doing is, is plating, electroplating zinc and uh, that is uh, a reaction that also does de degrade over time or has certain efficiency limits to it. So uh, we don't see those, either of those technologies surpassing vanadium at this point. Uh, but, you know, of course, there, there will continue to be innovation. Uh, there, there are lots of different chemistries, uh, and I'm sure um, things will evolve over time. The key is what's going to be commercially ready and how quickly can it be scaled up and deployed, as I believe Billy was, was mentioning before. The development cycle for these um, batteries uh, to go from the bench top in the lab to things that are the size of containers or uh, softball, uh, uh, soccer pitches uh, is uh, takes a, a lot of time uh, and uh, earnest development uh, to, to get to those scales. Okay, great. There's, we have a couple minutes left. I think the, the question, there are some other questions, but we more or less address them. So I'd like to tackle one more point, uh, which is technology we which went quite high in the polls. Actually, uh, after vanadium flow and lithium, it's well, actually, actually it's the second after lithium, so it's hydrogen. And there's been a massive push in a I mean, there is a massive push in Europe for hydrogen, and that's from the government's perspective and from the incentives perspective. And there is more and more credibility that we can, uh, if we can manage to have very low uh, electricity prices, we can uh, manufacture hydrogen at a site and uh, use it then either uh, for vehicles that could be hydrogen fueled or uh, to be injected back into a grid with a fuel cell. Uh, there is is a very interesting perspective, and this is a, there is a, a big belief from many governments, from the UK, Germany, uh, France, Spain, which are currently investigating this very seriously, uh, trying to answer the question: uh, How uh, is hydrogen the next energy carrier? Uh, maybe Billy, you can give us your your insights on this. What, what do you think of hydrogen as, a, as an energy carrier? Yeah, uh, so. Starting with a historic perspective on hydrogen, <laughs> uh, having worked on hydrogen. <laughs> Make it short. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Basically, next year is always the year for hydrogen, but I honestly think next year is <laughs> the uh, year for hydrogen. And the rationale is that I think in this seminar, uh, Future of Tech, um, in a post corona world, the new normal, I think a lot of people are looking at energy security and supply chain. And with hydrogen, okay, you can um, electrolyze water uh, to generate uh, hydrogen and use that. But also, you can do lots of interesting things with hydrogen. You can convert it into different chemical fuel stocks and have that as an export product. So I think finding new business models and new ways of uh, handling these energy vectors is very interesting. I mentioned before, decarbonization of heat is very uh, topical right now. And hydrogen has a big role to play. But right now, where we are is steam reforming of methane is still the most economical way of making hydrogen but that has a CO2 cost. So there still needs to be substantial decreases in the cost of electrolyzers. Okay, so steam methane reforming indeed as the as the main contender to beat, but there's the the thing that also you need to transport uh, hydrogen from steam methane reforming without, whereas with an electrolyzer, you can have it on site. Um, maybe Matt, what's your, what's your perspective on hydrogen and this infrastructure? Because I understand private, Pivot power is really around uh, building an infrastructure, both for the grid and for the electric vehicles. Uh, is it something you're looking at, following, interesting in? Um, we are. I mean, I think especially from a um, vehicle electrification, um, there has been a lot of you know discussion around hydrogen, you know, as the fuel, you know, at the vehicle level. I think there is there are a number of things, and I am not the the technology guru on this panel or even within my own company. Um, but it is, you know, something that our space constraints um, and issues that do need to be, you know, addressed. 
um, for some of the, you know, the physical size of some of the hydrogen charging stations that I've uh, personally seen um, being developed. I think at a stationary, you know, storage level, similar to all, you know, technologies, I think we'll, we'll take, you know, a view on this um, and going back to the start of the conversation, you know, what is investable, what is bankable, um, what will show those kind of returns, but also provide that level of confidence um, for investors to get behind. Um, so it's a kind of non-committal, we will evaluate the future kind of as it comes um, view, view to all of this. Okay, great. Uh, we've got five minutes left, so I suggest that we, so there's a, a lot of other points we, we had planned on, on tackling, especially uh, uh, there's one around the durations and the applications for storage. Uh, uh, we've moved in the markets in Europe more toward, from uh, frequency regulation, which is quite uh, short duration storage, towards more and more arbitrage and energy shifting. So maybe you can all take... Uh, one minute each, and I ask for no more, so that we 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 stay in within uh, time. Hi, yeah, Quentin. Listen. Yeah, just yes. just so you know, we we are able to overrun if you okay. still got a few points to cover. That's not a problem. Okay, so you can uh, you can go slightly above one minute each <laughs> <laughs> to both comment on uh, this uh, this application perspective and this duration. The question behind it, I'm trying to tackle, is what does the grid need? Because most of the lithium-ion batteries today installed are approximately one hour. We see more and more in the US, four hours. And I think, Jim, you, you have lots of comments on this in California. Um, but what, what does the grid need? And maybe a final thought. So, okay, we'll do it in two rounds. First, since we have a bit of extra time, thanks, Lucy. <laughs> uh, we'll have a first round of uh, what does the grid need and what's long duration storage? There's a lot of questions. Do we need uh, four hours? Do we need 10 hours? Would a uh, two weeks storage uh, duration make sense? Or would, would it simply not make sense because two weeks of uh, regime, of wind regime, uh, where we don't have any other electricity supply doesn't exist today. Is it for in a hundred years time or in 10 years? So yeah, please start with the duration and application, Billy, if you want. Yeah, um, so I think this question about what we need is, uh, isn't a static question. It changes depending on the electricity mix. So I think mm -hmm. whilst we aspire for 100% renewables on the grid, actually that's very challenging. I think it's quite easy to go 50, 60%, but that last 20% is increasingly difficult. And if we are trying to achieve that, then high penetration rates of solar and uh, wind uh, essentially necessitate longer duration uh, energy storage. I think as we move on to daily, if weekly or seasonal storage, uh, lithium ion batteries aren't uh, really viable, uh, and we need to look at uh, th those challenges there. But we also need to consider the consumption and the demand side as well. I think it's been broadly reported about the price volatility of oil, which is a big balance between supply and demand. And in the electricity markets, I think uh, given that the business model is so important, we also need to factor in um, the demand side and how we envisage that changing in the future as well. Okay. Yeah, so indeed uh, the, 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 the last percent of uh, renewable penetration we will cost a lot more than the first because you just need to add solar for the first and once uh, you've met your uh, your demand at uh, at noon uh, at lunchtime then you have to to try and store this and as we move along or uh, around this uh, degree this uh, increasing percentage of renewable you need an increasing cost of money maybe uh jim so what's your, what's your point of view the duration of storage what do we need today when do we need will we need more that than what lithium can provide what, what's your what's your thoughts Right, I, I think as Billy said, we're we're headed in that direction, uh, where you have daily cycling. Uh, Jim, it seems yes, like Jim. you're you're frozen from my end. So maybe Matt, you can uh, you can start, and we'll have Jim kick in afterwards. What, what's your yeah. your view on this in terms of duration? How first your batteries you're installing is one hour, right? The large batteries, the large lithium ion batteries, and you're having flow batteries. What's the duration of flow batteries on your systems? Uh, if you if you recall, and uh, what do you think we will need for the grid? Uh, yeah, the lithium components, they're, they're one hour systems. Um, we will revisit that. And we currently are for um, some of our future projects from 2021 onwards. Um, the flow system, uh, I should know this off the top of my head, but uh, believe the four hour uh, duration, mm -hmm. I'm pretty confident in that. Um, I mean, in terms of the 
question around kind of what we need duration. There is, to Billy's point, an always evolving and emerging change, or dare I say, pivot of you know a system and, and what it needs. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, kind of tongue in cheek, but that was part of the the rationale behind the name of the company. Um, I think you know the the hierarchy of the energy trilemma, you know, cost, carbon, um, and security, you know, is one that it's a, a bit of a political football, not just in the UK, I think in all all countries. Um, and I think coming out of, you know, post COVID, uh, what that's going to look like and a lot of discussion around the green stimulus plans and so on, will be very interesting to see how that uh, all plays out. Um, I think the realities in a pretty unknown future uh, is that a technology that can pivot, apologies, I got two of them in there, um, you know, is hugely, hugely beneficial. You know, multi-application, multi-use technology that can provide, and whether that's a frequency, you know, need or long duration need, it, there, are, there are a lot of different ways that, um, that this asset can kind of step in. So I realize that's not a very conclusive, you know, answer, but I think it is a big, you know, advantage uh, advocate for battery storage in all of its different guises, um, you know, to play a huge role. I mean, it's central role, basically. How can we get to a net zero system if we cannot balance inherently a more intermittent uh, system with more renewables coming on? You know, it, how much more wind and solar will come onto the system in the next year, in the next five years, the next 10 years? A lot of different forecasts, but there will be more. Um, I have yet to see any forecast that says there's going to be less. So. There's going to be less, uh, less wind and less solar <laughs> to, to integrate to reach, uh, to reach uh, the net zero goal in the UK. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that's quite uh, something we can agree on. Uh, I think Jim is still uh, having yes. issues uh, with his connection. Uh, so we'll, um, yeah, we'll probably... I can, hear, I can hear you, Jim. Yeah, Jim, Jim is uh, here. Uh, sorry, I can't hear him. Jim, okay, so maybe... Yes. Jim so, comments. I've... Yes. Oh, so uh, just a couple, three, three quick points there. I agree with Billy. Things are getting longer and longer, and, and that's an, another one. Maybe of it's only me not hearing or, him or DMI on. Uh, we're seeing the shift from our customers uh, from four to six to eight. Now, 10 hours seems to be the hot number uh, when you're looking at installations in 2022, 2023. Uh, on, on uh, with flow batteries, when you're going from say four hours duration to six hours duration, you're really only adding the cost, the marginal cost of the electrolyte and the tank. So, on a per kilowatt hour basis, we're probably 20% cheaper, uh, and then another 10% cheaper on a per kilowatt hour basis to go from six to eight hours. So, there are advantages in having our electrolyte separated out. Uh, to the point on flexibility, Matt's point there, yes, customers. Uh, once batteries are installed, they're not going to be doing the same application, serving the exact same market uh, market structures they are uh, now as they will be 20 years from now. And so having a battery that can do both power and energy uh, the way a flow battery can is, is also important. Uh, final note uh, there, uh, we're actually in the process of, uh, we're working with a, a major developer to replace a lithium ion battery that's been servicing the PJM market for frequency response uh, here in the US in Illinois, because the battery uh, after three and a half years is degraded to the point where it's no longer serviceable. So uh, short duration, uh, we, we're actually seeing calls for more uh, short duration one hour batteries now because of the durability, the, the, the high cycling capability of vanadium flow. But I think the, the biggest application will be uh, the, the six, eight, even 10 hour uh, applications for integrating solar and wind. Great. Um, I'm not sure. Quarantine, are you still here? Yes. I'm still here, but for some reason <laughs> I can't hear and or see Jim, so I, I have no idea where. <laughs> Uh, he's, that's why I thought you were just, offline. So. <laughs> he's just finished um, okay. that duration piece. Okay, that, that's great. So maybe we'll have the, the final thought on Lucy since I can't have Jim anymore. <laughs> and 
be let you uh, uh, wrap this up after the the final thoughts uh how about uh we all take uh, uh one minute to to wrap this up uh, maybe uh, uh maybe we can have uh, matt up first uh, then uh, then billy and then jim which i can't hear so i'll let you I'll let you conclude lucy uh thanks That's it. um yeah so again being the non uh, technical one on the panel here i think i'll i'll have less of a technical response i think one of the biggest kind of calls to action and the biggest requirements is is we as the storage industry need to really come together um if we've learned anything from previous consultations you know and uh, reviews of in you know government level incentives regulation and policy um changes that have always been um, evolving we need to come together and have an aligned view on what the market needs. Um, and I think that that is absolutely, you know, a prerequisite. I think there's also a real need for us to get our story, you know, right for the general public um, as well. And to allow, you know, a zero carbon system, it needs to be understood. I think that, you know, my 74 year old mother, you know, on our website, we have a small video and it was really to help me explain to my mom what uh, her son was doing. And I think that that is something that we really need to get people on side to see how essential it is to have a system because it's very easy for the general public. We can all sit here you know, in a forum and, and, and talk about this stuff, but we really need to understand you know, what the views, what the concerns you know, are for uh, from a general uh, public standpoint to really get that um, buy in and continue that momentum that we're starting to see at a grassroots level um, with a lot of things that have been happening um, and some of the pressures that are now being appropriately put on government to really make this uh, this dramatic change. So a non-technical answer, but really a coming together um, in alignment for the industry to move it forward at pace. Great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so actually, uh, now I can see you, James, and it seems to work again once I refresh the page. So, Billy, maybe you want to to give your final thoughts? Yeah, sure. So in terms of the theme of this webinar, uh, predicting the future of tech, I think we've all explored different scenarios for the future, and none of us and no one can actually predict the true future. Um, you know, you never know when a pandemic comes across and changes your future scenarios. Uh, and on that point, I just want to highlight the value of flexibility that uh, we, we do a lot of work in terms of optimizing a system, so optimizing the electrical network. But I think uh, people don't appreciate or should talk more about the, the value of flexibility and sometimes maybe picking a solution which we call the least regret solution, that maybe there is an optimal solution which in this um, beautiful scenario where everything goes to plan is the best. But if it doesn't, then uh, the bankability or the business case doesn't work out. So I think highlighting that flexibility, factoring risk into future decisions is important. And I think that comes back to, in the media, um, you'll hear lots of new exciting technologies come through. And I think it's important to temper that so that we kind of manage expectations of how fast the technology is going, but also be ambitious enough and aspirational enough to kind of paint a picture of what the new normal looks like in the future and how that can be greener than what we had before. Thanks, Billy. So, so, Jim? Yes, would agree with that. Uh, so for my last points, I guess I would highlight uh, life cycle cost. Uh, so life cycle cost is important, obviously, for the financial um, performance and, and the success of the project. Uh, life cycle cost also implies, you know, what are we going to do with the batteries when they're done? Uh, if we install the amount of storage that we know we will need to integrate solar and wind, and solar and wind is uh, essentially the cheapest form of new generation in, in most parts of the world at this point. Uh, we're going to have a lot of batteries and uh, we don't want to be in the situation where we're, we're throwing those batteries in a landfill. So uh, looking at the, the, the true end of life costs and the recyclability uh, is important. Uh, with vanadium flow, I think, uh, we have that recyclability and that green, green attribute. Uh, and we have a, a cost curve that that uh, bends towards being cheaper than than lithium ion as well. So uh, it takes time, as Billy says, for new technologies to get commercialized and scale up. 
uh, and, and we think we're in a, a good position to be the right kind of battery for solar and wind integration. Great, thanks, Jim. So maybe uh, just a fa final words uh, to wrap it up. So uh, I I think uh, be, it was a good uh, good hour to browse through uh, all the future technologies and what what's a technology. It's not only about cost, but also about bankability, about safety, about recyclability. We also mentioned the different applications and the need. Uh, I mean, we're we're definitely going to need more and more longer duration storage. Uh, in the future, so who's going to be next after lithium-ion is, is what we tried. We try and answer and highlight uh, what different technologies could bring. Uh, I personally have a big beliefs in uh, in hydrogen and uh, and flow batteries. We'll see how that turns out, and hopefully we can have a reconvene in a year's time or in a six months time with, with Solar mm -hmm. Media to chat again uh, about this and, and and what's been next. Thank you very much, everyone, for for uh, listening to 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 us. Uh, we are available for any other questions via email, via the platform, and we'll see you on the event of uh, Solar Media. Maybe, Lucy, if you want the final word. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Corentin, and thank you very, very much to all the panelists um, and also to the listeners and everyone that posted questions. I agree. I think it's been a really insightful and very, very interesting um, conversation. I'm sure we had even more to cover, but we'll leave it at that. Um, so, yeah, just a big thank you. And for the next session, we have a deep dive into the arbitrage model by Ben Irons. That will be um, at 1 p.m. BST today. So thank you for listening and goodbye. Thanks, all. Thank you, thank you very much. Have a good day, Ben. Have a good day.